have access to outstanding care and particularly for a community uh, where our city population is only 125,000. And our healthcare facilities are beyond what people in a community of this size would normally have the opportunity to access. Um, our caregivers continually raise the bar each and every day as the extraordinary people who provide excellent patient-centered care for thousands in our community. So our presentations today are focused on the latest advantage, uh, advances in stroke care and uh, stroke recovery support uh, from Providence Care. Uh, as I went around the room and spoke to a few people over lunch, I found at almost every table someone who had been personally affected by stroke, either themselves or a family member. And so I have a sense of how um, devastating that news is when you get it for the first time and how long that journey can be. And we just thank you for coming today and um, making this part of your day and part of the process of you, uh, learning to deal with stroke in your family. Uh, it's my pleasure to begin the uh, program today by introducing Dr. Ben Glover. <coughs> Dr. Glover is the Chief of the Heart Rhythm Service and an Assistant Professor at Queen's University and Kingston Health Sciences Centre. He graduated from Queen's University Belfast in 1999, which makes him a very young man. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, and after performing three years in internal medicine, joined the cardiology program in the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. He spent several more years training in general cardiology and subsequently subspecialized in cardiac electrophysiology in Toronto General Hospital, <coughs> as well as publishing in most major cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology journals. He's co-authored two books. A Clinical Approach to Cardiac Arrhythmia, and A Complete Clinical Handbook of Cardiac Electrophysiology, which he published with a co-author, Pedro Brugada. I hope I said that correctly. Dr. Glover has a special interest in the management of atrial fibrillation and ventricular arrhythmias, and is instrumental in building the complex ablation program here in Kingston. He also has a keen interest in teaching is, and is undertaking a master's in medical education through John Hopkins University in Baltimore. I don't know how he has time to do all this. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dr. Glover, please come on up and share your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, this afternoon. Um, I recognize some of the faces in the audience here, so it's nice to, to, to talk to you about atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat, and how it can potentially lead to stroke, and how we can prevent strokes by treating this irregular heartbeat. And um, I guess I've now spent quite a few years uh, dealing solely with irregular heartbeats. That's essentially my job. And uh, specifically, I, I've, I've really spent since I think 2003 uh, dealing solely with atrial fibrillation. Um, which is a uh, very common irregular heartbeat. It's the most common irregularity we see in clinical practice. And, uh, and I guess the reason why I'm here this afternoon is to talk to you about the potential risk of stroke with atrial fibrillation and how we can prevent that, which is very important. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me at the back. Yeah, okay, perfect. So this is the normal heartbeat. So the top chamber has one electrical signal which passes down through the heart to the bottom chamber. So there's a nice synchrony top chamber pumps, squeezes down to the bottom chamber. At one conduction beat in the top, one in the bottom. So that's normal. It applies to the vast majority of individuals. But this is what what, what we have to deal with, and this is, a, this is an irregularity, so the top chamber pumps very, very fast, up to 300 beats per minute, and the bottom chamber doesn't pump that fast, because thankfully we have a, a, a mechanism in the heart which can block out some of those beats from the top to the bottom, but it becomes very irregular. So it's not particularly fast, but it's irregular, <coughs> and the top chamber is, is super fast. And some people, mm feel extremely unwell with this. So they feel palpitations where the heart is very fast and irregular, they feel short of breath, they can't walk very far. Some people get chest tightness. And interestingly, some people don't feel that unwell with this. So there are some patients who 
present to hospital with a stroke and that's their presentation and suddenly we find they've got this irregular heartbeat. So our aim as, as physicians is, is preventative medicine. Our aim is to detect these irregularities and to treat them. And we can actually pretty much prevent the majority of strokes uh, in this condition if this condition is diagnosed and if we use the appropriate medication. We can, we can pretty much prevent uh, the majority of strokes. But that takes a little bit of work on our behalf and other, some of our colleagues' behalf. And we're still conducting quite a lot of research into this field, and we spend a lot of time in this area. And I'll, t and I'll maybe explain a little bit later on as to the research that we perform in this area. Clots form in the top chamber of the heart because it's irregular. The pump is irregular. It's, it's not coordinated. And there's a little area of the heart, a little outpouching of the heart, where these clots can form. So, so this is really why clots form in this condition in the heart. And in some cases, they will travel from the heart up to the brain and cause a, cause a stroke. So atrial fibrillation is extremely common. I, I, I honestly don't think I'm ever going to be unemployed. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I feel pretty secure. Um, it affects 33 million people worldwide. And we see it in all age ranges, actually. We see it in a vast... Uh, uh, number of patients, even young patients, but it is a condition that we see more commonly as individuals get a little bit older. And, and I read somewhere uh, that if everyone lived to 120 years old, that everyone would get atrial fibrillation at some point in their life. So, so it probably is a condition as you get older, it becomes more common. But we have seen it in individuals, and I have treated it in individuals as young as 17 or 18 years old. So, so it can affect young young individuals as well, which is important to know. Very, very common condition in, in Canada. Um, and uh, it affects about 400,000 uh, patients across Canada. So about a huge number of individuals with atrial fibrillation. And we can see that at age 60, it affects one in 25. And by over the age of 80, it affects about one in 10 individuals. Something that is, is very interesting is that um, it seems to be more difficult, like a, lot of, like a lot of things in cardiology, it seems to be more difficult to make the diagnosis in females rather than in males. And we think that's probably because the presentation, the typical symptoms that we learn about in textbooks aren't exactly typical whenever we look at female patients. And they, pr they may present in a slightly different way. Uh, so therefore, there, there probably is some sort of a gender disadvantage in atrial fibrillation, so it's a little bit different to coronary artery disease. And females, uh, being a female and having atrial fibrillation does seem to confer a risk. So in other words, there seems to be a higher stroke risk in females versus males. And, and I think that the explanation for that may be that in general, the <coughs> outpouching of the heart is just a little bit smaller overall in females than it is in males, and therefore I think it's more likely to form clot. So this is, this is actually very interesting. Um, strokes, and, and uh, like we're lucky to have a stroke physician here, but strokes secondary to this irregular heartbeat are generally pretty bad. I think that's a fair statement. Uh, you get a clot in the heart, it travels up and it blocks off a fairly major blood vessel in the brain. Uh, and therefore, I, I think it's probably fair to say that strokes secondary to this condition are probably generally worse than strokes due to the conventional blocking and, and narrowing of vessels going up to the brain. So very, very important that we recognize this before it pre pre presents as a stroke. Um, North America, uh, Canada, Europe, Australia, we see a very high incidence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, this might be just that we diagnose more in, in these countries, but we think that th there may be a component of lifestyle associated with atrial fibrillation. And uh, this kind of brings me on to my, one of my research interests, which is looking at the factors associated with atrial fibrillation. And I think there's a natural huge overlap between the factors which can cause this irregular heartbeat and the conventional factors which can just cause stroke. So these patients are are, are similar in many regards. Uh, but what I've, what I've kind of noticed um, over the last few years, I mean, I, I've kind of 
spent a lot of time doing fairly complex procedures to treat this condition, quite invasive procedures, which I think worked very, very well. But, but what I noticed was that the patient arrives to have their procedure done and, and suddenly you realise that they have all of these risk factors for atrial fibrillation for this irregular heartbeat, which just haven't been very well treated. So we seem to get a lot of patients who have a, a, an elevated body mass index, patients with high blood pressure, which is not well treated, uh, patients with obstructive sleep apnea, with diabetes, with all of these conditions. So we've actually taken a bit of a step back in, in cardiology from doing uh, procedures which are still required to kind of look in and go on like, why don't we treat the risk factors associated with atrial fibrillation? Why don't we go back even further and see if we can alter the progress of the condition, which makes complete sense. I mean, it seems like a very obvious statement, but it, it didn't appear to be obvious until recently to me. And, uh, and, and it's easier said than done. So we, we have a lot of patients who come with this irregular heartbeat who are, for example, overweight and have high blood pressure. And actually, when you look at the blood pressure, it's very poorly controlled. It's not well controlled at all. So is it right to perform a procedure? Absolutely not. You have to take a step back and, and intervene on lifestyle. This is very, very, very difficult, extremely difficult. And, and we're very lucky to have received a very generous donation from the Henderson Foundation to look at lifestyle modification in these patients. So in other words, rather than just doing a procedure, let's see if we can get patients to lose weight exercise, take blood pressure, adequate blood pressure medication, get their sleep apnea treated and see if it actually affects the condition. And there is data now to suggest that it does to the point that perhaps up to one third of these patients don't even need a procedure for their condition, which is remarkable. And this is something that we are conducting here and we're conducting it here out of Kingston Health Sciences and out of Providence Care and out of Queen's University. So this is pretty, um, I think this is pretty outstanding data. I don't want to get into too many details, but there's a lot of features in it which are quite unique. And we are running this as a, as a, as a pilot study in Kingston, which is going to be rolled out as a multi-centre trial across Canada. So I think this is, this is quite exciting. Um, other things that uh, we are interested in are looking at um, how to reduce hospitalizations for atrial fibrillation. We're actually, we have a grant from a, an, a, an organization called the Canadian Arrhythmia Network, which, which is a government-run organization. We've got a grant to look at ways to uh, prevent patients with this irregular heartbeat from attending the emergency department. It's very important. We think that a lot of patients who have this condition don't need to come to the emergency room for urgent treatment but that requires alternative strategies and education. And we've actually conducted a multi-centre trial based out of Kingston across nine centres across Canada. So it's, it's Ontario, Nova Scotia and British Columbia, looking at why patients come to the emergency room with these irregular heartbeats. So these are patients who have a known diagnosis of an irregular heartbeat and they still come with symptoms. And, and, and we find some very interesting findings. One of them is that patients whenever they develop this arrhythmia, whenever they develop an irregular heartbeat, they're scared that they're going to die. They're, they're scared they're going to die. They're scared they're going to have a stroke and they're scared that they're going to have a heart attack. And, and I think that um, if a patient is on adequate medical treatment, none of those things are going to happen. But no one tells the patient that. So education, very important. Uh, but that takes time, right? So we need to have a system where we have time for our patients to sit down and talk and explain this. And if we can actually develop a system where we can reduce emergency room attendances by 30% across Canada, that's going to save a lot of money for the government. So that's an interesting study. And then finally, at the very end of, of, of the, I guess the very end of the condition is, is what I'm doing here is, is putting catheters or little wires inside the heart, which is again what I spend the vast majority of my life doing and uh, this is where we actually can go minimally invasively up through the groin into the heart and we can eradicate these short circuits from the heart you don't need to have your chest opened up we can go from the inside and something which i've been working on lately with my colleague dr bisleri who's a nice italian guy uh, so it's the irish we, we call it the irish italian combination um, 
but the what, what we're working on is we have developed a system where I go up through the groin inside the heart and he makes two little holes in, on the side of the chest, tiny little microscopic holes, and we actually do procedures from the inside and the outside of the heart, both sides of the heart, all around the heart, without opening the chest. Uh, and, and that is first in Canada. So we are very proud of that. Um, thank you. And we have we have now published some of our data, and honestly, it's uh, some of it. I, I don't want to blow me on trumpet, but some of it is very impressive. So I'm, I, we're very very happy with that. So, you know, I think that we are pushing the envelope, so to speak, in terms of what we do. We don't rest. We always want to do better. We always want to strive more. And you know, we do treat patients today with the best, in my opinion, the best care you can get anywhere. That's my opinion. I, I think that if you go to a centre where they're doing research, where they're always trying to do more, that's a good centre. So that's what we're doing. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask me. Okay. Did any of that make sense? <laughs> yes. Four days, he was back the symptoms again. Do you have any statistics on this? Yeah. So the zap was the cardio Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so yeah. I'll repeat the question. So uh, we were essentially talking about the. Um, so there's various treatments for this irregular heartbeat. One is medication. Two is electrical cardio which is the zap where we bring a patient in and we put the pads on the chest and shock the heart back to normal. And then the third is where we go inside the heart and essentially burn tissue inside the heart or burn the focus inside the heart. So the zap almost always works acutely. So you'll, al you'll almost always get back to normal rhythm, but you almost never will stay in normal rhythm, if that makes sense. So, you know, we, we do it sometimes to um, see how some patients feel after a cardioversion because some patients come up to us and they don't really totally know how they feel like they're sort of going I think I'm just getting a bit old and I can't walk as far and I get a bit short of breath and I usually say look let's do a cardioversion and find out what like because people kind of just change with time let's see what you're like in normal rhythm but the vast majority of patients who we cardiovert or shock back to normal rhythm at some point will end up going back into atrial fibrillation because we haven't treated the underlying cause it will flip back again and that can range from 10 seconds it could go back within 10 seconds and sometimes we get a surprise and some patients stay in normal rhythm for like a year but it's the ma minority of patients so what i would say if you've had atrial fibrillation for over a year the heart does remodel it does sort of get used to the irregular heartbeat it does change a little bit but that's not to say we can't get it back to normal and the 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 approach which I describe where we go up through the leg and then through the chest, the average duration of atrial fibrillation for those patients was four years. So the average patient I select for my catheter ablation is, I like less than six months because I think we get a good result. Four years is extremely, extremely aggressive and it's, it's, we're, we're choosing very difficult patients on purpose. Yes? Are all of your patients on anticoagulant? almost all of them uh, so th there is a slightly different realm to my job where there are some patients who cannot take anticoagulants so almost everyone who's referred to me can take an anticoagulant but there is another procedure which I do called a left atrial appendage closure where essentially the area of the heart where clots are most likely to form we can put a little plug inside that and, and close it off we can do that from the inside or from the outside of the heart uh, and, and we select patients for that procedure who cannot take anticoagulants. So in other words, if someone has a high bleeding risk on an anticoagulant, but they've also got a high stroke risk, and you know, I think Al would see these patients, this is a, this is a reasonable uh, alternative option. I, I don't think it's better than anticoagulants, but I think it's better than nothing. 
so we do we do see these patients, uh, but almost everyone that I see is on an anticoagulant, and I think we're moving more and more and more towards more patients being anticoagulant. For sure, there's more patients anticoagulant now than there was five years ago, without a shadow of a doubt, because previously you had warfarin, and that was it, and now there's lots of other alternatives to warfarin, which are much easier to take. So we're going to have to hold other questions till the end. Uh, Maybe there's one. Just, no. Well, we're five minutes into time. <laughs> <Okay. presentation. Okay. laughs> <laughs> pacemaker, I'll just be very quick. Uh, a pacemaker can have a part to play. A pacemaker will work if your heart rate's slow. It will not treat atrial fibrillation. So if your heart goes, some patients, their heart goes too fast, too slow, then a pacemaker will be effective. thanking Dr. Glover. I think he'll be here for a few minutes when we conclude and of course the foundation is always happy to assist you in uh, passing your questions along to him um, so that we can get answers for you. So thank you very much Dr. Glover. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Al Jin. Dr. Jin is an associate professor in the Division of Neurology with a cross appointment in the Department of Biomedical and Molecular Sciences and is a specialist in cerebrovascular disease. Prior to joining the faculty in 2008, he completed residency training in neurology at Queen's University and completed a cerebrovascular disease fellowship at the Calgary Stroke Program in Calgary, Alberta. In addition to his clinical duties, he's the medical director for the Regional Stroke, ne stroke Network of Southeastern Ontario and serves on a variety of committees with the Ontario Stroke Network the Canadian Stroke Best Practice Recommendations Writing Group for Stroke Prevention, and the Royal College Neurology Examination Committee. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to, to speak to, to your group. Um, it's, uh, it's quite an honor to, to do this. Uh, this is a very personal story for me. Uh, stroke care is, is one of those things that I've been passionate about for most of my professional life. Um, and to be able to deliver something to the region which, which you know, was there for my family uh, is, a, is a big deal for me. I've been in Kingston for over 40 years. Uh, my family came here uh, in the 70s with very little. Uh, and the region was very welcoming and, uh, and very generous to my family. So at some point, I guess in life, we all have to help the people who helped us. And so this is one of the things that, uh, that we've done to try to help our community. Um, as I go through this story, uh, you know, behind every great program, there are great people. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the great people that I work with, because without them, we don't have a program. And uh, you see some of the people on the, on the left side of the, or the right side of the screen is, you never get to see this guy's face. He's always wearing a mask. So that's, that's guy, that guy is Dan, Dr. Ben Massari. He's the head of our neurointerventional program. And he was a key player in making sure that we could get this program off the ground. So the program that I'm going to talk about is called endovascular thrombectomy for stroke. And what happens in stroke in about two thirds of all cases is a blood clot finds its way into your brain and blocks off blood flow 
to sometimes two-thirds of one side of your brain. It's, you can lose a big chunk of your brain, and these, these sorts of strokes are often fatal. And if they're not fatal, then you're left being paralyzed and unable to speak and re being unable to rejoin normal life for pretty much the remainder of your days. And so these are quite devastating. Um, in our region, we see a lot of this, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the case that really uh, brought things to a head for us was when I had a pack of 17-year-old kid into an ambulance to send him off to a place not in Kingston, to Ottawa, because we couldn't do this procedure here. And so that, that had to end. So uh, I won't go through the, the YouTube video, but I'll, 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 point, I'll explain what's happening as we go through. Okay, so this, this procedure called EVT is a revolution in stroke care. It's the biggest change in stroke care in probably the past 30 years. On the left side of the screen, what you see, uh, actually, what you see up here is a, what looks like a whole bunch of black lace. This, this is actually blood flow in the brain. What's missing is that you should see all of this around here. And similarly down here, there's not a lot of black lacy stuff here, which means there's not a lot of blood flow in the brain. That's happened because there's a clot right about here, which is blocking blood flow. And when you remove that clot, this is what you should see. This is normal blood flow in the brain. And this is the revolution in stroke care that's really happened since 2015. There were five major clinical trials doing this, and everyone around the world realized that this is a revolution. But like so many revolutions, some places will get left behind. And Kingston was in danger of being one of those places. So, uh, a group of us decided that this is not acceptable. Uh, I, like I said, I've been here for 40 years. Uh, I've seen too many friends uh, come into the emergency room, uh, and it's hard to not be able to help them. So, <clears throat> this group of people, uh, the neurologists, the emergency, uh, radiology, the paramedics, uh, we all got together and we said, we have to do something. Uh, this is a very, very, diverse group of people. Um, I don't know what you know what it's like to herd cats, <laughs> but this is essentially what we have. We have very strong-headed, very, uh, very skilled and competent people who all know that what they think is, is the right thing. Uh, and so to, to bring that group of t people together, they're all doctors and nurses. I mean, do you really think doctors and nurses are ever going to agree on anything, right? So it, it doesn't really happen that well. What you need, you know, to organize people, you don't necessarily need doctors and nurses, you need people who know how to, how to organize things. And so there's a lot of people behind the scenes in this program who you never really get to meet. Uh, one of these people is our, our program director for the stroke region, which is, her name is Callie Martin, and she is an operational genius, and somehow, uh, she also ha must have a PhD in psychology because she's able to assuage everyone's egos as we bring this program together. Um, to give you a sense of what was required for this, this was her outline of the plan. It's deliberately complicated, right? This is, this is like herding cats. There were over 55 uh, action items that we had to accomplish over 15 months. There were 40 people who were coordinated to pull this together, and this was before we started. It took 15 months to prepare for this. Um, I will say that it all started with um, a conversation which happened in a pub, uh, which is where a lot of good ideas, I think, happen, uh, between myself and one of our interventional radiologists, Alex Menard. Uh, and then, of course, as happens with so many ideas out of the pub, the organization, the follow through for that is usually not that inspiring. And so you need someone who really has a, has a very sober minded sort of outlook on things and who can actually pull things together. So yeah, yeah sorry, getting a little personal there. Uh, so <clears throat> what you see in this picture here is what had to happen before the green box, which is when we decided to, to actually do this. The other thing I have to mention uh, is that this is an example of the preparation that we would do. So this guy here, the guy with the crazy hair, is Alex Menard. And know that he's not hung over in this picture. He just looks that way. Uh, that's me. Uh, and there's the rest of the team here. Uh, so we, we prepared for this. And the thing that was interesting about all of this is that this procedure is so new that guys like Alex, who are doing this procedure, they do this for free. There's no, the government doesn't pay them to do this. There's no compensation and there's no billing code for them. And they just decided that's okay. This is something we just have to do. So 
<clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about what happens through one person's story. After 15 months of preparation, after numerous drills, we drilled this again and again and again in the morning and in the evening on everyone's own free time, and then we decided to go live and offer this to the region. So our story starts in Brockville. Uh, there was a 75-year-old woman around 9.15 in the morning. Uh, it's interesting, she was a very <laughs> active person in her community, very lively, had a very productive life. And uh, all of that comes to a grinding halt at 9.15 one morning. And the only thing you can hear from her is her breathing. She can't move her right side and she can't talk. Her family found her, this, this woman who really helped them and supported them throughout her entire life. And right away called for the paramedics. So they patched through. The paramedics in our region are exceptionally well trained. They're smart enough to know that she's not going to get what she needs in Brockville General Hospital. We're going <laughs> directly to Kingston. And so they bypassed Brockville and came directly to Kingston and phoned us ahead of time. They radioed in and the whole stroke team was activated and we assembled in the emergency room waiting for this person when she arrived. Uh, this is how many people it takes to treat a stroke patient in the first 10 minutes. There's about 13 people on this, 14 people on this slide, and that's how many people are coordinated in the first 10 minutes of care. It's actually more than this, but this is sort of the minimum that's required. It doesn't cost money, it just requires everyone to know exactly what you're doing. Kind of like this, right? So this is NASCAR, right? I, I work, I, I have the misfortune to work with someone who is in love with NASCAR. Uh, and I, I don't get it, but anyways. Uh, the one thing I did learn about NASCAR is that people work together. People do one job. Everyone has one job and you don't screw that up or else everyone else on the team knows about it and tell, lets you know about it. And if you screw up one part of your job, nothing works, which is why you have to drill this again and again and again and again. And so we do this over 400 times a year now. So this is what it looks like in the merge this in case a CT scanner. You have numerous people, all hands are on deck. The paramedic is there. The CT tech in this picture is the woman in the middle. She's the one in charge. It's not the doctor who's in charge. We recognize that if you want to make things work, you don't do this from the top down. You do this, you give the authority and the responsibility to the person who has the most information and who is the most competent in the moment. And in the CT room, the CT tech rules the roost. So they tell us what to do and we fall in line. Uh, we've, it's interesting to see doctors um, fall in line to uh, <laughs> taking orders from other people. It's actually quite nice. <laughs> and the reason we do this is because we don't have time to establish a hierarchy as we move the patient through the hospital. Every minute that we delay, that's two million neurons that are dead, that will never come back. That's 12 kilometers of connecting wire, myelinated fiber between neurons that die, and there's 14 billion synapses, 14 billion connections which are gone. If we can treat this person one minute faster, we will give them one more week of life. So everyone moves very, very quickly. So we got to the scanner within five minutes of arrival. Uh, we do a, a very special, a very particular sequence of images on the CT scanner, and that helps us make some decisions. So when we look at something like this, this is a cross section of this woman's brain. Uh, and it looks normal, and that actually is a cause for alarm because a normal brain is a brain which can be saved, and if you don't move, you're going to lose this brain, and this person will likely die. So uh, when we see this, we everyone turns it up a notch, and everyone starts moving a little bit faster, and the urgency is there. This is another sort of image that we do, and the red arrow shows you where the problem is. So let me see if I can get this thing to work. Yeah, I can treat stroke patients, can't figure out the laser pointer. Uh, yeah, really, I am more competent than this in my professional life. Uh, so this is, this is, see this sort of white snaky line here? This is blood flow going into this side of the brain. In this case here, that white snaky line gets interrupted right here, and that's a major problem, because that problem it's only about two to three millimeters long. That's the, how big the blood clot is, but that will kill this person. If we don't get rid of this clot, that person will probably die. 
So this is what we see. We had to do a lot of innovative things. You know, Kingston is a center which has always been told we're too small to be big and we're too big to be small. So we're in the worst possible position where we have a lot of responsibility and not enough resources to do it. And so it forces us to innovate. One of the things that we did was we realized very quickly, it sounds like an innovation, sounds like an admission of incompetence, but really we said, we don't really know how to do this, right? We, we can train ourselves, we can practice this, but we need to figure out a way to get some mentorship into place. So what these guys did here, there's Alex and there's Ben. Uh, they connected with this fellow named Brian. Uh, and Brian Van Adel is a very experienced neurointerventionist, but he's in Hamilton. And he can't just come down here whenever we have a case. So what they did was, and this was amazing, this was mostly Alex what he did, uh, who did this. He arranged it so that what they do in their angio suite is visible on Brian's computer screen in Hamilton. He also set up a camera which could be, Brian could control from Hamilton, which could zoom in on the team. Uh, it could zoom in right on their hands and he could guide them in real time as to what to do, what they're doing. Um, it turns out this was a very effective system and it was kind of weird listening to Brian's voice coming from the air, uh, telling people what to do or telling people that they're doing fine. He, in fact, he didn't really have to tell them to do anything. He just said, oh, keep going, you guys are doing great. Uh, and it was, it was sort of this weird disembodied voice, but it worked very well. And this sort of telephoroscopy is a world first. We, no one has done this before, and we were forced to do this, and it worked really, really well. So it's just an example of one of the things that had to be done. This is showing what's happening in this person's brain. Uh, this black snaky line is blood flow. It's interrupted here. It's not really all that great up here. You should see a lot more black snaky lines up here and there isn't that happening there because there's a clot there. So this is their first pass. This is their first image of what's happening in the brain. And as you can see, it's a whole lot of empty space here. Uh, this person's brain is very much at risk. This is what happened when they finished their procedure. They reestablished blood flow to most of this person's left hemisphere. Uh, and as a result, this person was able to walk out of hospital. So this person was snatched from being dead. They were basically dead on the table. Uh, they, were, they were not going to survive. Uh, and so within two days, they're basically independent again. They're on their feet by day three. They walked to the transfer vehicle to bring them to Brockville, because that's where they're from. We, we don't send people home directly sometimes if they come from Brockville. We, went, we put them back into Brockville just to make sure that CCAC and community care would have everything in place in case they needed it. In fact, they didn't really need it. They just sort of hung out there in Brockville for two days and then they just said, oh, screw this, I'm going home. <laughs> and, so, <coughs> and so that's what they did, they went home. Um, I saw them in, in clinic uh, a few months later and they said, um, you know, things happen really fast. I don't really remember what happened. Did I have a stroke? And I said, yeah, it was, a, it was going to be a big one. They go, well, I seem to have brushed that one off too. So anyway, so I didn't ask them what they meant by that, but uh, I assume that this person has been through a fair amount uh, in life. The result of all of this, so that's just one story, uh, but the result of all of this is that over half of our patients who have had these devastating strokes have been able to return back to the community and continue living with their family and friends. Um, without that, we would have seen less than 20% of these people going back. And usually that 20% who return to the community are going back to the community in long-term care. Uh, so we're able to get people back on their feet again with this, which is something we don't usually see. I still remember one case where we, we had this poor fellow on the table and uh, he, the clot was removed and uh, he shook everybody's hand on the table. He went from being paralyzed to shaking everybody's hand right on the table. Um, yeah, everyone was pretty, everyone was pretty uh, overwhelmed by that. Um, we were told that our region is too small. Well, we've done this now 40 times since we started this program. And in fact, we've been doing this every five days. Um, yeah, it's to the point, and it's gonna be more because we're now learning through the work that we've been doing about how to extend this to more and more people. Um, what, we've, what the team has done here is quite remarkable. This is the first group in Canada to do this without a neurointerventionalist, which is a big thing because there aren't enough neurointerventionalists around and there never will be. In the UK, only one hospital can do this 24 hours a day. Um, it's, it's desperate enough in the UK that, believe it or not, they've asked us how to do this. Uh, so I've been talking to the Dean uh, at Oxford, uh, Dean of Medicine at Oxford University, Alistair Buchan, who came to visit us. 
and he's sending a, one of his associates to come visit us again um, as a case study of how to do EVT in, in Britain. Um, because they need this as much as we do, right? There's 65 million people there and only one hospital can offer this in the evening or on the weekend. Uh, they looked at what we've done and they say, you know, you guys might have the answer for us. So it's what people have done here. They've helped the community, but in fact, they might be able to help everybody. Uh, and so it's, a, it's quite a team that I've been uh, honored to work with here. Um, I'm just going to finish with a couple of other stories. Uh, this is a <laughs> yeah. This is a guy who was shaking everyone's hand. Uh, people were pretty ecstatic about this. This is, I think, our third case that we did. Uh, this this was a fellow from Napanee. Um, he yeah, it was it was interesting. He started shaking everyone's hand and talking to people, and then the very next day he wanted to go to the bar. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> There's something about our region, right, when people are feeling good, right, yeah, yeah, yeah they, want to, they want to celebrate. Uh, so this made it into KGH this week. Um, we were still, because we're still early days into our program, we're still collecting our data, but so far the data is very consistent with what I told you earlier here. We'll probably be publishing this in the next, uh, in the next few months. We've already presented it on, on a number of, uh, on the national stage at, at the Canadian Stroke Congress already, and we'll be presenting it again at the World Stroke Congress this fall. Um, this case really got to me. Uh, so this was a young woman, she was in her 30s. Uh, she came in the ambulance and tumbling out of the ambulance is this poor woman who can't really move her left side. Her husband is in the ambulance and he's got a nine week old baby in his, in his arms. Um, nobody speaks English. Uh, and so it was difficult. They spoke French. Um, so it was, it was okay, right? I mean, we could communicate with them. But the reason this really got to me is because uh, this could have been my folks, you know. Uh, and I'm just, it just bothered me that um, we've seen this situation before this group uh, where we couldn't help them. Uh, and so to be able to do this for this family was, was a big deal for me. So what have we learned? Um, well, we can do this, right? We were told we can't do this, and we've shown the world we can do this. And so we're going to continue doing it, and we're probably going to do a lot more of it. Uh, we learned, well, doctors and nurses learned that um, in order for things to work together, you have to be able to talk to each other. Uh, and this is among groups of people who normally don't talk to each other. Uh, I usually don't talk to the interventional radiologists, and now, well, we go drinking. So <laughs> that seems to be the final common endpoint for everything, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, communication and understanding in a place like Kingston, it's it's critical, right? And it's 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 what makes things work. It's the program is built on great people, uh, and. Uh, we know that we change is what we thought was possible in stroke care. You know, it wasn't so long ago that when you had a stroke and you were in hospital, I'll be frank, the, uh, the attitude among people in the hospital was that this was custodial care. You've got your disease, you've got your disability, now live with it and adjust to the new normal, and that's the end of the day. Um, now we know that's not true, right? Now we know we can make a difference if we have our head in the game and if we're organized and we pull things together as a group. So, you know, it's one of those things where you say, they say teamwork makes a dream work, and, and this is very much one of those cases. So, th thanks very much. We're a little tight for time, so I'm going to just invite uh, questions as at the conclusion of our overall program. And again, we'd be happy to pass questions along to Dr. Jin. I just have to say, uh, I'm feeling very much a sense that we're kind of living in the extraordinary people innovative healthcare theme today. Um, two extraordinary speakers so far and a third one yet to come. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Jin, and I would like to invite Mary Jo Demers to come forward. Mary Jo graduated from the University of Windsor in 1985 with a degree in human kinetics and came to Kingston to study at Queen's University, attaining a degree in physiotherapy in 1989. She's worked for Providence Care for 28 years, primarily in the area of neurological rehabilitation with a focus on stroke rehabilitation and has been a professional practice leader for 18 years. With a primary interest in movement science, she's been involved with the education of physiotherapy students from Queen's University and many of the edu educational workshops confer and conferences provided by the Stroke Network of Southeastern Ontario, including the mobility section of the Brain, Body and You series. 
She's a guest lecturer for the Limestone School Board Adult Educational Pers Personal Support Worker Program, and for the last 10 years, she's been involved with the Beacon Kinarm Robotics Research Project, led by Dr. Stephen Scott from the Laboratory of Integrative Motor Behavior, the Department of Biomedical and Molecular Sciences Center for Neuroscience Studies at Queen's University. <laughs> and in fact, uh, Ann Vivian Scott is here as well. She, uh, she's a partner with uh, Stephen in helping to develop and, uh, and distribute this amazing technology. This technology allows researchers to explore brain function in humans as they interact with complex mechanical and visual worlds created by robotic and software tools. Mary Jo. Wow, I have uh, big shoes to fill because we had two wonderful speakers here today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch our course a little bit and talk a little bit about the rehab side of uh, stroke rehab, uh, the journey for stroke uh, patients. I've been working, like I said, uh, that was introduced for 28 years, and I've had a, a, a pleasure of working with many stroke survivors in this community, some of them which are here today. So one of the things that I'd like to introduce you today to are two pieces of equipment that have recently been acquired by Providence Care to help the person uh, who has suffered a stroke in their stroke journey. And this is based on functional electrical stimulation. Uh, okay. So stroke rehabilitation is the process of restoring and regaining physical strength and function. It is based on neuroplasticity, which is the property of the central nervous system to unmask or, um, uh, unmask or uh, regenerate other neural pathways and synapses to take over for the areas of the brain that have been damaged by a stroke. Research tells us that this neuroplasticity depends on the performance of functional, meaningful tasks. And this is what we hope that functional electrical stimulation will provide for us. Functional electrical stimulation is based on the uh, excitability of the nerves and muscles tissue to contract and provide movement. It is an external uh, source of electrical current to stimulate the peripheral nerves, generating muscle contractions and patterning of muscle activity. The benefits of functional electrical stimulation is that it encourages neuromuscular re-education and restoration of functional activity. And there are secondary um, benefits from this that actually feed into that primary benefit, and that is the re reversal or prevention of muscle atrophy so that we can maintain the, the size of the muscle for strength and power to work. It improves local blood circulation for the conditioning of the muscle. It increases and maintains joint range of motion so that we have efficiency of our movements. It reduces muscle spasticity, and spasticity is an overactivity as the, of the contraction of the muscle that can hold the limb in a certain position and make it very difficult for patients to move. It also makes a limb or a hand or a foot very heavy, so that too makes it difficult for them to move. Because this uh, technology can be used to uh, a repetitive uh, pattern for functional tasks, it helps the patient maintain their motivation as they're actually moving through their therapy. It also increases the speed and stability of their movement for fall prevention. So at Providence Care, we have two functional electrical electric stimulators that we use in stroke rehabilitation. We have the RT300 from Restorative Therapies, and we have two Bioness systems from Bioness. The first one I want to talk about is the RT300. You can see it there. This is an arm and leg ergometer. So it is motorized, and what it allows the patient to do is move in a cyclic fashion. So it's almost like a bicycle. It facilitates muscle contraction and activity 
even if the individual is unable to actively create the muscle power, so that external electrical force is actually being applied to the muscles at the time in the cycle that they need to receive that uh, electrical current to actually contract. So for example, we can use this for both arms and legs. So if a client is cycling like this on the machine and they need to extend their arm, the excitability will be given to the triceps muscle that actually works to extend our arm. So it's working on that cyclic pattern. So it's not an all in one nothing. It's on and off, on and off, on and off so that that movement can take place. And if the patient can't generate that movement themselves, the ergometer allows that, but still gives that electrical impulse to the muscles to be active. With this machine, we're able to activate <coughs> six groups of muscles on either side of the body. So for someone who has a hemiplegia and they need uh, working with the leg, we can apply electrodes to six different muscle groups. So upper, uh, front and back of the upper leg, front and back of the lower leg, oh sorry, um, the muscles of the hip and the muscles of the back. The nice thing about this is equipment is that it is very easy to set up and very reproducible. So if we're looking at the amount of therapy that patients get in the very short period of time that they're in hospital, once this is set up, we can actually work with them on a daily basis and we can get our assistants to actually set them up on the equipment. So instead of maybe giving them 30 minutes to an hour of therapy, they're actually getting anywhere between an hour and 90 minutes uh, of therapy to help increase their, their rehab intensity time. So for overall improvement. The nice thing about this too, we can set the parameters based on the comfort level of the client and the need for the amount of current they require to actually get a good muscle contraction. It's also fun for them, and I think I have a photo here of what they look at when they're actually cycling. So we have there's an avatar that's on the screen when they're when they're cycling. That avatar can be either a male or a female. We can actually ask them if they want to wear a helmet or not, and I always put a helmet on them. <laughs> They also have a choice if they want to cycle through the city or the countryside. And as they're cycling, the scenery changes for them. So it's a really nice apparatus so that if they're, if they're able to stay on the apparatus for 30 minutes or more, they're not so bored. There's always something changing that they can look at. The nice thing about the controller here too is this controller can leave the, the full apparatus and we can take it to a bedside or some other area of our work environment to actually produce this reciprocal movement patterns for other tasks. So I, have, I hope I can work this. I have a client right now, is this going to work? Oops. Yeah. There we go. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize there's so much sound. So, but this is one of my stroke patients right now. She's about four months post stroke. We put her on this for the first time last week, and she absolutely loved it. And you can see how much she's concentrating on on the avatar that she's using because depending on how much force she's giving through th each leg, the avatar will, avatar will shift from one side of the road to the other. So uh, if she stays right on the center line, she knows that her legs are working in unison together. And this is just the, uh, shows you how we can program each specific muscle group to allow optimum facilitation. So the next uh, 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 functional electrical stimulation tools that I want to present to you are the BINES, and I'm really excited about these because these are neuroprosthesis and they're very portable. There's individual components and I have some of them here today too. So after we're finished, if people would like to take a look at them, um, I'm more than happy to take them out. The nice thing about these is each of these components work um, wirelessly through radio frequencies. So in the therapeutic environment, 
unlike the ergometer I just showed you, even though it's a great piece of uh, machinery, there's a lot of wires <laughs> that need to be connected to make it work. With these prostheses, there are no wires. So the patient can actually leave the therapeutic environment and we can work with them in their rooms for dressing or grooming tasks. We can work with them in the kitchen if they're learning how to cook so that they can hold on to something, a ladle or a pitcher so that they can pour water. Um, we can work on dressing training with them because there's so much adaptability to these pieces of equipment. They too deliver the, the consistent electrical stimulation and we can program them however we want to in, in terms of serving the client. The first one is the H200. And I'm just going to pull it out because you can see how small it is. It's easy to apply and it's, it's very lightweight. So the nice thing about it is, is there's not an extra heaviness for the person when they're actually trying to, to work their hand. This, it has electrodes so that there will be impulses that would be given to the front of the, and back of the arm and at the thumb to allow uh, activity of the flexors and extensors of the wrist and hand in order, in order to grasp uh, objects, release objects, and pinch objects. So I have a couple videos regarding this. The first video here is of a, a young woman who had a stroke. And at this time, she's about a year out of having her stroke. And she has some tightness in her hand and actually has no active mobility in her hand. And this is the first time after her stroke that she's actually seen her hand open up without somebody else opening it up for her or her own hand opening it up. So I think her, her face is priceless in terms of how this technology works. Oh, uh-oh, uh-oh, <coughs> that's interesting. I don't know what happened there. Did I hit something? No? I don't know why that did that. I thought it was just me. <laughs> no. Zoom in, yeah. see all slides. We may have to just keep going. Okay, so they tell me I have to keep going. <laughs> so let's keep going. Let's see if this one works. Okay. This young woman had some activity in her hands, but she couldn't really open up her hand well to uh, re uh, grasp something. So the nice thing with this equipment, it allows them to repeat the activity over and over again without actually having someone to hold their arm all the time. So it helps strengthen the hand, it helps build that motor control or that understanding of how they can move their hand and their, or their arm so that they can do functional tasks. So the next one is the same lady but this is more functional. So now she's holding a pitcher and is actually pouring water. And she's working with her student here, right, right, one of the students right now. So the student is learning this technology as well. We hear a lot of laughing when we use this equipment. I want to skip that one. So the second part that we have in terms of the Bioness is the Bioness L300 Plus. So one of the common deficits that people have following a stroke is weakness in the leg that causes a foot drop. So this orthosis helps prevent that foot drop. There are three pieces to it. There's the orthosis that goes around the lower leg just below the knee, and that's the area where the nerve and muscle is that will help lift the foot when you're clearing it off the ground when you're walking. There's a control unit that stimulates and, and signals to allow the stimulation to occur and a gait sensor that goes into the heel of the shoe. So when someone is walking, when their foot lifts up in order to swing it through, the pressure, there's no more pressure on the heel which senses, um, senses the heel sensor to send a sensation to the stimulator to stimulate the muscles of the leg to actually lift the foot so it can swing through without hitting the ground. So it doesn't stub, their, people don't stub their toe, that's or, or they don't trip and fall. 
As soon as the heel goes down onto the surface again, that pressure signals the stimulus to stop, and then the foot drops down to uh, be able to bear weight for standing when we're walking. The benefits of this is that it encourages a normal walking pattern and people can walk further with it. It helps reduce falls when they're walking. And the other thing, it eliminates a, a brace. Now we still use braces in our, our therapy. We have to because they're a little bit cheaper, but patients find the braces to be bulky, heavy, and difficult to walk with. And it certainly doesn't allow for a, a normal na a gait pattern when you're walking with a brace. The second part to this is the thigh cuff. And I really wanted this piece when we were ordering this because I felt you can't just work with improving the, the foot and the lower leg. There is that component of the upper leg that needs to be addressed when someone is walking post-stroke. So this piece of equipment actually stimulates the muscles of the thigh, either the quadricep or the hamstring muscle, whatever we need to optimize that walking pattern on the individual. So I have another, oh, here we go. I don't know why that's happening and I'm moving on. <laughs> and hopefully, and hopefully this one. So the first picture was the same lady that's on here. Hopefully this will work. But um, she was walking with a brace on her foot and she was walking a, with a cane. Now certainly she was able to walk, which is fabulous. But you, if we could show the video, but, um, a lot more effort when she walked. She had to really work at the hip in order to lift her foot, in order to swing it through and not stub her foot on the ground. As soon as we put this unit on her, oh my goodness. Sorry, I don't know why that's doing that, but as you can see, she's lifting her foot up off the ground well, and she's lowering her foot. There's not as much effort with her walking. And believe it or not, we had her on this treadmill walking for 40 minutes, and within 20 minutes we had her running. And her goal is to run, it's still to run, she, I couldn't get her off the machine. <laughs> she found it amazing. So this is someone who is just barely walking and with this equipment on, she was running. So I have no idea why that's doing that. So in conclusion, we have two really incredible systems that we are using in rehabilitation to encourage more functional activities in our stroke patients. The nice thing about these equipment, the, this equipment is we're not just using them for our stroke patients. We're using <coughs> them with our spinal cord patients, our, our um, head injury patients, anybody that has an upper motor neuron lesion that has actual problems trying to initiate active uh, muscle control and activity. We're also, the nice thing about it is both our occupational therapists and physiotherapists are trained to use this equipment. So there's a, ri a wide variety of people that can use it with the different clients that we have. There we go. Sorry about the videos. <laughs> So we're running a little behind, but some of you just got dessert, so I think it's, it's destined to be. Um, you know that at these events, we very often ask a patient who's had experience with the care program being highlighted to come and talk about their experience. And so it's my pleasure to invite Andrea Fawcett to come forward and just speak a little bit about her experiences with the stroke programs across the city hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief, too. I'm a little shy. Um, <laughs> I'm a little humbled by all of this today. Um, had my cry listening to Dr. Jin because I just sort of relived everything that happened just two years ago. I had a stroke. It left me paralyzed top to bottom on the left side. Um, and I didn't know until I got out of bed in the hospital the next morning to go to the bathroom and I was laying on the floor. I had no, no idea what had really happened overnight. So. Um, I have been lucky enough to have the benefits of the care at KGH and with Providence Care and Mary Jo and to be first-hand recipient of some of the tools that she uses. As excited as I am about your new ones, 
um, because I still don't <coughs> lift my foot properly. And I was one of those patients who butt heads with my physiotherapist because I couldn't feel the floor when I was standing up or when I was walking or trying to do the things that she was trying to help me to do. Um, I just couldn't and I sometimes I still can't so I'm very excited for the new tools that she has because it's it's something that will go a long way to helping everybody. You know we all we all recover from our strokes differently and until I saw you Stu I was going to talk to um, my my time with um, KGH and the stroke unit and a lovely gentleman that I shared kind of the the unit with for a couple of weeks and then, until we both moved on to St. Mary's for our care and I watched him and his recovery and I watched him motoring down the halls at St. Mary's in his walker and I'm in my wheelchair and I got to keep them up because I couldn't. I couldn't. I had no response. I kept this woman up at night um, for weeks and weeks trying to figure out w what is going to make my body respond um, until we started using some of the electronic therapy. So it was exciting. And Stu was walking out the hall with his walker, and I would steal my roommate's walkers when nobody was looking at night because. <laughs> I closed the doors and I made the nurses promise not to tell. And uh, so I had I had some training, um, but uh, yeah. And I'm I'm not a hundred percent. And I you know I'm only fifty three and I've had two, and it's it's a long haul. And you get impatient. And I was the most impatient of patients and uh, wouldn't listen. Didn't believe that it was really happening. Um, but as those things happen, when her hand would start to move, if my toes would move, didn't know whether it was me, whether it was just my brain saying, okay, you're coming back. It's very exciting and I'm, still today, um, I will notice things differently um, the way I walk, um, that I can walk almost normal. Until I get into a small space, um, I'm, I'm pretty good and I forget that I'm recovering from a stroke now, which is really kind of exciting because it's been a long haul. I, I don't know what to tell you. It's like I said, we all we all recover differently, and we all have different therapies. And some work for some people, some work for others. I am a bull in a china shop, and and I, I love to be able to come and, and share some of the stories. Just to say that as awful as it is, and it was pretty traumatic finding out that I had no limbs um, on my left hand side. Um, this guy came and said to me, "No, you'll walk." And you did that the very next day, and you took a look at my charts, and he said, you're going to be okay. It's going to be a while, but you're going to be okay. And then she says to me, on my way out the door, I didn't think you would ever walk again, which is the most exciting thing for me because it was, it was very difficult. Um, yeah, I'm still not walking, but I'm doing all right. And, uh, and you, you saved my life. Um, Providence Care. KGH saved my life just getting me back into the routine and, and using these therapies. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty humbling just to be able to stand here and, and say it's it's okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Andrea. I think uh, the prospect of living through two strokes before the age of 53 and having to tackle that kind of recovery is just um, awe-inspiring and congratulations on how well you've come through that journey. Well it was our hope today to showcase some of the extraordinary people and uh, innovative approaches to care but also to give you a view to what donations have done. So I'm not sure if it was clear so I'll just reiterate in our uh, summary here that the study that Dr. Glover and his colleagues are doing has been very generously supported by a $500,000 grant from the William J. Henderson Foundation. I wanted to acknowledge the presence of board member David Pattenden here today and to thank the foundation for their support of that research. And the functional electrical stimulator system, one of them that has been used at Providence Care, was purchased this year with gifts made by donors to University Hospital's Kingston Foundation. So all of you have played a role in ensuring that the stroke uh, identification, prevention, intervention, and rehabilitation services across our hospitals are well-resourced 
and well positioned to apply their efforts to thinking about innovation and improving stroke care rather than having to struggle with not having the resources and not having the equipment that we need. And I just want to invite you to uh, join me in thanking all of the speakers today and also the staff here at the Donald Gordon Centre. Um, just a few final words. Uh, our luncheons are becoming increasingly popular. We had a waiting list of about 20 people who were not able to join us today because we didn't have seats. So we are looking for ways that we can make our educational programming available to people in addition to luncheons. And there is a survey on your table that invites you to comment on topics that you would be interested in hearing uh, have covered at future luncheons. But also we're interested to know if you're the kinds of people who might download podcasts or watch videos or read uh, research papers if we send you a nice uh, lay language version of some of the information that's shared at these sessions. We'd also like to encourage you to join us for one of our Macquarie Passport to Healthcare tours. The first one for this 2018 year is April 11th. Uh, we are planning to tour one of the operating suites, Providence Manor and the Clinical Diagnostic Labs. Um, the labs in particular are a fascinating tour if you've not had the opportunity to go through. Uh, we currently carry out about 8 million tests per year in the lab fa facilities at Kingston General Hospital. And if you have the opportunity to go through that space, you'll realize what a, a miracle of teamwork that is. Uh, Dr. Jen talked about the 13 people um, gathered around the patient in a stroke uh, intervention situation. Um, when you see our labs and you see the number of people who work in that space and the constraints of the space, you'll think they're miracle workers as well. And of course, uh, these are all areas where we're going to be making investments through uh, donations from the community in the years ahead. You are so welcome to stay. I, I suspect our clinicians all have appointments lined up. <laughs> uh, but if you can snag them and ask them a quick question, you're welcome to do so. And again, I do just want to convey to all of you, you're welcome to pass your questions to us, either by completing a form on the table, or phoning us, or emailing us. We'll ensure your questions are passed along and try and get answers for you. Thank you very much, all of you, for your generous support. It is heartwarming beyond words to see all of you here today. I'm sure that you share my feeling that we are very, very fortunate to live in a community of this size and to be supported by caregivers who are so focused on doing better for us and on finding, I think uh, Dr. Jim used the words, um, uh, we have lots of responsibilities and not enough resources, so we rely on innovation to fill the gap. And aren't we lucky to have people who that's their mindset when they come to work each day. Thank you for joining us.